in the previous video lecture, we saw the two crucial ways in which the idea of Aujitya functioned in literary theory. I am sure you will be now wondering whether Sanskrit poetry actually conformed to these notions of Aujitya set by literary theory. According to scholars like Pollock, Sanskrit Kavishastra tradition for the most part did not veer away from the generally accepted notions about the representation of character types and situations. It encouraged typicality and did not usually pose a resistance to the dominant worldview of the society. Pollock, in his introduction to Bhanu Datta's Bokke of Rasa or Rasa Manjari, says Sanskrit poets were interested in exploring typicality and accordingly needed to master it across the whole universe of emotion. How were women expected to act when first falling in love, when confronted by an act of infidelity on the part of their lovers, when desiring someone other than their husband? To answer such questions, a discourse across, arose that aimed to construct a typology of character. This typicality in the representation of character types and situations was maintained throughout the history of Sanskrit Kavi Shastra, uh, primarily through the process of Kavi Shiksha or the formal training of poets. Formal education in the art of composing literature was absolutely compulsory in the Kavi Shastra tradition in Sanskrit. The exponents of Kavi Shastra propagated the view that a Kavi, even if he was naturally endowed with the talent of composing poems, will have to remain in will remain incomplete as a creative writer in the absence of a proper training or shiksha. Thus, Kavi was made to undergo a conditioning process before the production of Kavya. It is a truism that Pradipha or inborn genius was often privileged over Vyutpati or training. But Vyutpati was indeed an unavoidable element in the making of a poet. Writers from Bhamaha onwards talk about the importance of formal training in Kavya. Bhamaha opines that the desire to compose Kavyas could be entertained only after mastering all Shastras necessary for the composition of literature. Dandin is of the view that just as a blind person is incapable of differentiating between different colors, so also a poet devoid of training cannot distinguish between poetic merits and excellence. He observes that even if a person falls short of Pradipha, he or she can excel in the art of composing Kavya through sheer training. Vamana uh, is of the opinion that an aspiring poet should get trained in literary science to distinguish between poetic merits and poetic faults. As far as he is concerned, even if one is naturally endowed with poetic genius, he should definitely undergo a formal training before writing Kavyas. According to Mammada, Kavya is the result of knowledge born of a study of the world, of sciences and of poems and the teachings of those versed in writing poetry. Jayadeva even compares Pradipha to a seed and training in composing poetry to the soil where the seed of Pradipha grows. In his Kavya Mimamsa, Raja Shekhara says, the prior knowledge of Shastra is essential for an appreciation of Kavya. Just as nothing is visible in the dark without the aid of light, so also no poet can create without the knowledge of Shastra. In Sahitya Mimamsa, Mankha says that a Kavi should be endowed with three essential prerequisites such as instruction or Shruta, practice or Apiyoga, and poetic genius or Pradipha Shakti. All these testify that one was not born a poet but made a poet. It should be noted that although learning of rhetoric and prosody was very important, it was not the only uh, uh, aspect of Kavi Shiksha. Kavi Shiksha also meant learning of other arts and sciences such as Kama Shastra or theory of erotics, Artha Shastra or the theory of politics, Moksha Shastra, the theory of salvation, etc. These texts codify the idea of propriety in various fields of knowledge in day-to-day -day life. Kavi Shastra 
borrowed the norms of social propriety relating to various uh, these aspects from various uh, other scholastic disciplines and used them as a tool of introduction, indo indoctrination for poets. It is no wonder then that a poet who underwent Kavi Shiksha did not produce anything that challenged the propriety of the period. Vamana's observation about the importance of a poet conforming to the normalized truth claims of the society recorded in Shastras typifies how Kavi Shiksha functioned in preconditioning a poet in the way Aujitya demanded. The dosha that Vamana refers to as Vidya Virutham or uh, opposition to dominant knowledge systems is clearly an attempt to condition the poet according to the dominant moral and social view. Vamana opines that any representation of facts against what is written in Shastra will be a blouch on Kavya. To demonstrate the poetic blemish called Vidya Virutham and warn the poets against it, Vamana cites a few examples. According to Dharma Shastra, it is to restore justice that kings conquer the world. If a poet says that, it is to satiate their material desires that kings con conquer countries that will result in a poetic blemish. According to Danda Shastra Nidhi, it is because of a person's prudent conduct and diplomacy that others succumb to him or her. But if someone says that it is a person's aggressiveness that enables him to win over others, then it clashes with the socially accepted norm of Danda Shastra Nidhi and consequently results in the poetic blemish of contradicting uh, Chadurvarga Shastra. He gives another example which is at war with Kama Shastra. According to Kama Shastra, lower lip or athara is the right place to kiss, not the upper lip or uttaroshtha. Contrary to this dictum in Kama Shastra, if a poet states that the upper lip is the right place to kiss, then the poet will court a poetic blemish. Vamana's injunction that a poet should always pay heed to these Shastras which draw a neat line between what is acceptable and unacceptable within a social framework is something which runs through the whole system of Sanskrit poetics. The poet who got trained in the Kavi Shastra was thus encouraged always to produce the cultural artifact in the way the Aujitya preferred. We can undoubtedly say that this pedagogical practice always served as an effective tool in the Sanskrit literary circle to make the creative writers compliant and to suppress any deviant representation of character types and emotions. This kind of uh, prescriptivism not only suppressed the emergence of uh, alternative ideologies, but it also predetermine the very nature of character types and their actions even before a kavya was actually composed. In other words, even though the name and the local habitation of the characters and the objects changed from kavya to kavya, their representation was predetermined by the laws of propriety or aujitya. But its insistence on the suitability of all aspects of literature from the word to character traits, Aujitya preempted any attempt in Sanskrit literary tradition to pose a resistance to the truth claims endorsed by the society in general. To put it in uh, contemporary sociological terminology, we can say that Kavishiksha functioned as a soft power which aimed to affect others to obtain preferred outcome by co-option and attraction rather than coercion. By propagating the idea that conformity to Aujitya or propriety is necessary to compose an excellent Kavya and to become a creative writer par excellence, the dominant class in the society won over the creative writers to produce literary works in tune with its interests. The poets who were under the sway of the soft power of the uh, uh, society uh, willingly self-censored themselves and conformed to the stereotypical notions of representation prevalent in the society. The theory of Aujitya preconditioned the representation of 
character types and emotions and situations in Kavya in compliance with the interest of the dominant groups. Because Kavya often functioned as a tool to socially condition the readers in accordance with the rules of Purushartha. The term Purushartha refers to the teachings of the four goals in life such as Dharma or righteousness, Artha or wealth, Kama or pleasure and Moksha or salvation. Dharma aims to teach duties, rights, laws, code of conduct and the right way of living. Artha is concerned with the proper pursuit of wealth. Kama relates to the right way of indulging in pleasure both sensual and sexual and Moksha takes up the question of activities that a person should necessarily perform to attain liberation. Sanskrit literary theories uh, as early as Bharata have entrusted Kavya with a deontic function apart from its primary function of aesthetic pleasure. Uh, actually Bharata is a reference to the context in which Brahma asked him to compose Nati Shastra is a pointer to Bharata's didactic philosophy of art. In response to the uh, sage's query regarding the origin of drama, Bharata says that he composed Nati Shastra to enlighten the morally degenerate people of Treta Yuga. Bharata uh, says, when Treta Yuga began, the entire world became corrupt and the people started following what he calls Gramya Dharma or indecorous lifestyle. At this juncture, gods approached Brahma and uh, asked him to create a new Veda so that people of all castes could become righteous. Thus, at the behest of gods, Brahma created Natya as a tool of didacticism. Brahma's declaration about the function of Natya, which is reported by Bharata in Natya Shastra, is worth exploring here. Uh, Brahma says that Natya, which is uh, based on the actions of three kinds of human beings, namely Uttama, Madhyama and Athama aims to instruct the spectators of all time about everything in the world. Quoting Brahma's words, Bharata says that Natya came into being to instruct men, to show the didactic function implicit in art, Pattatauta, as recorded by Abhinava Gupta in his Lojana, draws an interesting analogy between Rasa, Drama and the Veda. According to Tauta, Rasa is the delight. Delight is the drama and drama is the Veda. Pamaha, who is considered the founding father of Kavishastra in Sanskrit, shares the opinion of Bharata. According to uh, Pamaha, composition of good poetry produces ability in Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha. In his commentary upon Utpada's Kavya Alankara Sara Samgraha, Pradiharendu Raja, Raja opens that, Rasa is indeed a source of instruction. Rudrada in Kavya Alangara in fact privileges the deontic function of Kavya over its aesthetic function. He says, does not the knowledge of Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha reach sensitive minds easily and pleasingly through poetry? People are always wary of Shastras. Therefore, poetry contains Rasa to serve the purpose of Shastras in a joyous manner. Uh, Abhinava Gupta in his Lojana on Ananda Vardhana's Loga says that the study of good poetry gives readers skill in Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha. In Vakrokti Jivida, Kuddhaka also sees Rasa as a means to instruct readers about the four ends of life uh, in a way that is conspicuously distinct from Shastra, Puranas and the Veda. Kuddhaka's position is that while the Shastra and other allied disciplines talk about the moral duties incumbent upon men in an insipid way, Kavya performs the same function in a pleasurable manner. Kundaga says, uh, literary artifacts such as Mahakavya create pleasure in the nobles. The noble persons like princes are supposed to learn the ends of life such as Dharma, but being fickle and joyous by nature, they are reluctant to take an effort to learn them. Kavya will be like a toy to them. Therefore, they can learn dharma of life in a pleasurable way. In Kavya Prakasha, Mamata also holds the same opinion. He says, poetry brings fame and riches 
knowledge of the ways of the world and relief from evils and counsel sweet as from the lips of a beloved consort. Uh, although uh, Mamada privileges deontic function over the aesthetic pleasure, uh, he in fact believes that Kavya has indeed a deontic function. According to Abhinava Gupta, what lies beneath the pleasing veneer of aesthetic emotion is undoubtedly a desire to instruct and advise. For him, Rasa is a sugar coated pill for the young princes who are neither educated in scripture nor have received any instruction from history. Abhinava's observation is not worthy here. Princes who are not educated in scripture, the words of Shruti and Smriti which consist in commands like those of a master to do this or that and who have not received instruction from history which like a friend reveals to us the connection of cause and effect with such persuasive inst uh, instances like this result came from such an act and who are therefore in a pressing need of instruction for they given the power to accomplish the wants of their subjects can be given instruction in the four goals of man only by our entering into their hearts and what enters into the heart is the relish of rasa the imaginative experience of emotion now since this rasa is brought about by the union of the vibhavas and their related factors a union which is invariably connected with instruction in the four goals of man it follows that the subjection of a man to the relishing of the rasa by a literary construction of the vipavas etc appropriate to rasa serves at the same time for the instruction or vipatti that naturally results in this way literary delight is an aid uh, to instruction uh, in 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 sahitya darpana vishwanatha opines that even a dumb head will be morally enlightened through their consumption of kavya. He says, since the attainment of the fruits consisting of the class of four, that is the four great objects of human desire, merit, wealth, enjoyment and liberation is pleasantly possible even in the case of those of slender capacity by means of poetry only. Therefore, its nature shall be now set forth. In Shringara Pragasa, Pauja also declares a literary artifact should be understood as a combination of sentences that informs us as to what we should do and when we should not what we should not do.